This is an introduction on what is Raman spectroscopy and why is it useful. Brought to you by Metro. As an introduction, why use Raman spectroscopy? People turn to Raman for both for material identification and material verification. So both what is it and is it of acceptable quality? Our customers like the technique because it's extremely rapid and used in busy environments. No sample preparation is required for the scanning. You can scan through packaging, which avoids the requirement to open up and reseal containers. And that includes glass and plastic, both transparent and semi-transparent. And the technique as well is truly portable. As you can see on the images on the right hand side, it is palm sized and can be used where the material identification is required. So what is Raman spectroscopy? It's a fingerprinting technique based on scattering of light as opposed to a technique such as infrared, FTIR, which is based on absorption. We use a high intensity laser and we use a single wavelength and fire light into the sample. For every one million photons we fire in, all but one of those will come back with exactly the same wavelength shift associated with it. That's approximately one in a million will show a characteristic shift, which is called the Raman shift and allows us to identify the materials. Signal comes from all organic materials and some larger inorganic materials, which we'll concentrate on later. No sample preparation is required and the system can be used to focus the laser to scan through sample containers, such as glass containers, brown glass containers, polyphene bags, HDPE, etc. So what does it tell you about the sample? We see sharp peaks, which effectively are due to the functional groups on the sample we are testing itself. So here you see a selection of different, uh, different molecules with different functional groups and we see a nice difference in the fingerprints associated with, uh, with these groups depending on the structure of the material. How does a handheld Raman work? Essentially, we take a high intensity laser source and we focus the light onto a sample through a focal lens and we have a selection of these depending on the type of sample required. The Raman shift is collected by filtering out the single wavelength which we're using from the laser and just collecting the Raman shifted signal back into the device. We use free space optics to send the light through the system and we split the light on a holographic grating into its component wavelengths and then we focus this on a linear detector here which effectively gives us the, the signal back into the, the device itself. There are no moving parts associated with this so the light path is uh, not requiring a moving mirror for instance so it's completely insensitive to vibration and can be carried around accordingly. Metro have a patented Rama design which is based on complete free space optics so we are not using fiber optics whatsoever. The glass in fiber optics can cause attenuation of signal which means that you have to scan for far longer and this reduces the analysis times as well as having a far better signal to noise ratio because of this so it gives us better verification of the sample, less false positives, less false negatives. And it also means that we don't have to use a, um, an overpowered laser, which may cause burning of the samples. And we're also going to discuss a slight additional effect of this in a second as well. How does Raman compare with other techniques for identification? So here we're comparing Raman versus near infrared and the mid infrared, which is commonly known as FTIR. Comparing techniques, you will see that uh, the both the FTIR and the Raman both have very sharp fingerprint type structures for their chemical libraries. FTIR is extremely strong for polar molecules, as you see here. So 
you have carbonyl groups, halides, functional groups such as carbonyl bonds. Raman is extremely sensitive for uh, non-polar molecules. So we're looking at organic molecules, so carbon to carbon chains, and also functional groups. The big difference between these two techniques is based on the, um, the sample preparation, as FTIR either requires preparation of a disk or subsampling of a, uh, a selection of product and direct compression under an ATR crystal. You cannot scan through glass nor plastic because the mid-infrared is extremely sensitive for those, as is water. And as I mentioned, Raman is uh, less sensitive for polar groups, so aqueous space solutions are also acceptable. Comparing both of these to near-infrared, you see near-infrared also has the, um, the added ability to scan through uh, plastic and glass materials although you see a slight bigger interference on this side of things and that needs to be taken into account when building libraries more commonly. Near infrared uses broad overlapping bands and typically requires chemometrics, which is uh, applying mathematical treatments to accentuate the differences between the samples to get the, the data out. So in terms of the strengths and weaknesses of all techniques, the FTIR is most widely used and we have there is extensive fingerprint libraries available. The Raman again extremely similar in that side of things but uh, its big strengths are the portability and the lack of sample preparation. The near infrared above the other two techniques has better uh, capabilities in terms of quantification techniques um, because it's uh, more representative of the sample and uh, extremely sort of reproducible in terms of uh, looking at small differences between different samples, so very useful for quantification. The drawbacks of each technique, the FTIR is almost exclusively benchtop based, so products need to be brought to the sample and you need to have direct contact with a sample, so subsampling is always going to be required and sample preparation, so preparing the disks and such like is important. With Raman, we get, do get some influence from what we call fluorescence, and fluorescence is typically where the, the sample absorbs a laser light and lets out wavelengths at lots of different wavelengths back. So this can overwhelm the weak Raman signal, and we do typically see it more on extremely highly colored materials um, and also it, the other sort of uh, effect which you often see it on is some, some very natural products. So we do have some techniques for removing marred fluorescence, but um, for instance, something like plant leaves and such like it could not be identified with, uh, with Raman using the, uh, this form of wavelength because uh, they absorb the light and fluoresce back. For veneer infrared, the biggest drawback is the fact that you do need uh, chemometrics for all sorts of analysis. So um, for doing material identification, it's certainly possible and feasible, but uh, you do often require more samples to build your, your library to get uh, good, suitable results. So practicality and usability. How do you obtain the best spectra? So when using Raman, we are applying a laser source and the spot size of that is important for the resolution of the sample. A small spot size gives you a very high resolution, as you can see here. But you may also suffer with inhomogeneity or missing particulates on the sample. So especially seen in mixed powders um, and also in things like uh, powders which have a more granular nature and such like, using the small spot size means that you can occasionally miss areas of interest. A larger spot size covers a, a bigger area and so is more representative of the sample, but it can lead to a poor resolution used uh, or shown in the, the final spectra. So what does this look like? An example, this uh, is a, an effervescent cold medicine which contains three different APIs. Effectively, we've taken 20 scans here using a, a fixed laser spot size and taking different scans across an entire bag. So as you can see, the resolution is very good. Um, most of these peaks are in the same location and we would be relatively confident of getting a, a match score on here. But as you can see, the consistency is not that suitable using this fixed laser. 
The modern solution is using a technique called ORS, also known as orbital raster scattering. So here we're using a 45 micron laser um, and we're rastering it over a, a three millimeter area here. So effectively, what we are doing is moving the laser using a mirror um, and using our small spot size so we can ensure we're covering all of the particulates. And this is included as standard on all Metrome systems. The reasons we do this is it provides confidence in sample identification and verification. So less false positives, less false negatives. And how does this look? So this was the same sample shown earlier, utilizing the orbital raster scanning, and it's rastering over a three millimeter area. And we see here that the consistency of the scan is excellent and all of the peaks are lining up extremely well. And again, this gives you extra confidence when you're doing your matching that you're going to be collecting the, the, correct, uh, the correct sample. So again, great resolution, great reproducibility, less false positives, less false negatives. So practicality and usability, we need to consider size and weight. Handheld ramen tools are designed to be used portably in a production environment. So Metrum's mirror systems are the smallest and the lightest on the market. This becomes useful for actual practicality of the operators using it. So for instance, um, the system is truly one handed, so you don't have to sort of uh, support it as a great weight. You're not holding it up for minutes on end because the system is extremely efficient and so collects the, the spectra very quickly. And in terms of usability, the intuitive touchscreen device and optimized sample workflows mean that there's less operator involvement required, there's less room for error, and the systems are extremely well regarded because of that. So looking at some practical examples, we consider the pharmaceutical raw materials testing marketplace. So here, identification and verification is extremely important. And in the pharmaceutical marketplace, the regulators are now pushing for 100% testing of every single raw material container which comes on site. And the opening of packages, subsampling, bringing them to a lab can be extremely arduous and time consuming as well as costly and give uh, more room for error in terms of mislabeling samples, etc. Customers are turning towards handheld ramen because the audit trail is extremely robust in terms of this process, in terms of you can scan a barcode, scan the sample, collect the results and release the material into production. It's now highlighted in the, the pharmacopoeias, both the, the US pharmacopoeia and the European pharmacopoeia. And we have solved a number of challenges for our customers and we can give some examples on the next page. So here we're looking at differentiating very similar materials. So here we see a selection of organic acids with very subtle changes in the structure, both in chain length and also in terms of some uh, subtle differences in the functional groups. And as you can see, using a simple peak picking algorithm, all of these materials are extremely similar and will give the opportunity to get false positives and false negatives. We've developed a technique which looks at very subtle changes in the spectra and allows us to provide a what we classify as a verification on the sample. So here we're looking at minor differences in the, um, in the bands, both at this region here, around 900 wave numbers, and also subtle differences in the peak shapes and sizes of these bands, just short of 1500 wave numbers. What we do? is apply principal component analysis to the system. So effectively, we're looking for very subtle differences in those, uh, those peak areas I, I specified before, and we get uh, an extent where we call sort of hoteling. So the, uh, the, the samples are completely uniquely identified for the system and are very discreet. And in practicality terms, this is exactly what you look to see. So we train the system as to what each of the, the raw materials looks like. And we expect to see when we scan those particular samples, a pass on the correct one and a fail on all of the alternatives. So this will effectively give you confidence in getting the correct score. And this would 
be extremely useful if, for instance, on these samples, you'd be running an infrared scan and then having to run a subsequent GC or something like an NMR to confirm what the materials are. Whereas here, we can confirm straightforwardly on the Raman system that the, the sample is correct and release it into production. There are a huge number of different applications for the Raman, but I've provided a few examples on the page below showing some interesting work which we carried out previously. This is some identification of extremely structurally similar organics. These actually were two different flavors. And as you see, a little bit of a problem for the production environments because not only are the structures extremely similar, but also the names are. The difference is one double bond between these, uh, these two structures. And as you can see, by looking at the green versus the blue spectrum, we see some very clear and uh, significant differences between the two samples. And there would be no chance of misidentifying which material is being used in the production environment. For plastics, packaging, uh, monomers as well. So in plastic production itself, the, the Raman shows extremely good selectivity for different types of plastics and also their raw materials. So it's used extensively both for sort of plastics verification and also in the, uh, the production of plastics. So uh, raw materials for the plastics environments and final product. We also use a system for verification analysis. So this is for an anti-counterfeiting application. And uh, here we are applying the system to um, verify anti-malarial tablets in the field in sub-Saharan Africa. And effectively, we can see uh, some very nice tight groupings between the sort of uh, the genuine sort of uh, genuine products and uh, the counterfeited materials. And effectively, this is also extremely useful using our orbital raster scanning because you get to see more of the tablet itself and it becomes more representative and improves the confidence score of the match. I mentioned slightly earlier in the presentation that the system can also be used for identification of inorganic materials. So with Raman itself, we can analyze larger salts. So things such as sulfates, carbonates, which are shown here, phosphates, nitrates, as well as more complex materials such as minerals and gemstones. Essentially, what we see is a, a clear peak shape associated with the, the sulfate peaks in this particular instance. And effectively, the different cations which are bound to that sulfate cause a clear and defined peak shift, which means that we can specifically identify between things like uh, ammonium sulfate, potassium sulfate, sodium sulfate, etc. This is extremely useful because on infrared techniques, these, system, uh, these samples look extremely similar to one another and would need to be verified by alternative techniques. Whereas on the Raman, you can do it in a straightforward manner. For portable explosives testing, this has been used extensively in the past and we see a, uh, a selection of uh, the multiple explosives which can be identified with Raman testing. And again, extremely useful for the um, hazmat teams and also for portable counter IED teams. Similarly, on the defense and security side of things, uh, portable Raman systems are used extensively for street narcotics differentiation. So here you see a collection of white powders, uh, again, with extremely, uh, extremely clear differentiation between which one is which and the identification of the system is very straightforward. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this presentation. Um, please do get in touch if there's any information required.